will quickly introduce our um, our speakers. Um, Chris, is it possible? Chris, God, God likely, please can you turn your video off um, before I do so? Um, so to introduce the speakers, um, yeah, we have three very talented engineers presenting on the work they're currently doing in the offshore, in the field of offshore wind this evening. Um, firstly, that will be Dr. Crystal Aberdeen from the University of Cambridge, and she's presenting on prediction of cyclic performance of offshore wind tur turbine monopiles, recent progress and challenges. Christel is a lecturer in civil engineering at the University of Cambridge, spe specialising on the design of foundations for offshore wind applications. She completed a DPhil at the University of Oxford and continued studying there through a PDRA working on the PISA 2 project. Second, we will have Dr Chris Pierce from Atkins, who will present on prediction, prediction of fatigue loads in offshore wind turbines on monopile foundations using tower top accelerometers. Chris is a principal engineer in the design advanced technology practice of Atkins infrastructure division. After completing his PhD in engineering at the University of Exeter, he joined Atkins to work as a consultant engineer. And finally, we'll have Dr. David Wilkie from UCL, who will present on fatigue reliability of offshore wind turbines using Gaussian process regression. David is an EPSRC Doctoral Prize Research Fellow at UCL and is focused on the reliability analysis of offshore wind turbines. He completed a PhD at UCL and worked as a structural integrity engineer in the oil and gas industry. And so following these three presentations, we'll then have a Q&A session. So Christelle, I'll hand the stage over to you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Can you now see my screen? Yes, it's coming through and we can hear you. OK, good, thank you. So uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about foundation design in the context of prediction of the cyclic performances. Um, and hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, so I promised that I would start off with a small introduction on offshore wind. Uh, I think we're all gathered together uh, today because offshore wind is expanding massively uh, and it's been uh, developing uh, from the North Sea onwards uh, for the last couple of decades or so. Uh, and uh, we've seen massive improvements in the design that have been mostly driven by uh, reducing the cost of offshore wind first extending the service life of, exi of existing wind farms, uh, bringing new wind farms further offshore to harvest stronger and steadier winds, uh, designing for larger turbines to enable larger uh, power generation, uh, and finally adapting our design to a uh, new location in the words, which come with their own challenges, and I touch upon one of them in my presentation. And uh, those aspects are very general. They touch upon all uh, the all parts of uh, the design of an offshore wind structures. But in my presentation, I'm going to uh, be focusing on the foundation parts and uh, the support structure. And uh, you've got different technology to support those very big turbines. They've been really growing over the last uh, few decades. So um, we now have really, really large turbines. But in my work, I've mostly both be focusing on monopiles. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and the reason for it is that monopile support uh, most of the current offshore wind turbines. Uh, they're just gigantic steel tube pipes. I remember when I started my PhD back in 2011, we had three to five meter diameter piles. They're now eight to 10 meters. We're talking about 15 meter diameter piles. Uh, they're usually uh, short and rigid. Uh, and uh, they've been really becoming huge over the last few years. And during the uh, uh, design life of one of those monopiles, you're going to have to come across installation, 
And then designed to monotonic load, this is your big extreme event that's going to determine your uh, capacity, but also the stiffness of the foundation. Uh, it's lifetime performance and uh, the cyclic loading response of the foundation. And finally, it's decommissioning. And most of the talks today are focused on uh, lifetime performance and cyclic loading, and so is mine. Uh, the other three topics are research uh, topic in their own right, but I won't cover them today because that would take forever. And uh, in the cyclic loading response, I'm going to distinguish between long term slow cyclic loading and short term dynamic cyclic loading. And, and this is a confusion that there is currently in the design guidelines, as in uh, the short term cyclic loading and uh, the short term dynamic cyclic loading and the long term slow cyclic loading are, uh, are, are currently um, designed using the same uh, methods, at, at least if we follow DNVGL, uh, but this is mostly because there is a, a lack of understanding uh, of uh, how uh, the response differs. Uh, so if I look at the long-term slow cyclic loading response, uh, my challenges are first predicting the accumulation of permanent deformation, and this is something really important in offshore wind because the tolerances on the accumulated deformation at the ground level are very tight. They're commonly 0.5 degrees, uh, so you want to make sure that over the lifetime of the wind turbine, this is not going to tilt by too much. Second uh, challenge is to uh, be able to predict the monotonic response post cyclic. So make sure that after the entire wind turbine of your uh, lifetime, uh, if you have a big extreme load, this is not going to uh, have changed by too much compared to your original design. And then when we look at the short term dynamic cyclic response, uh, we want to know what the seismic response is when we are looking at the seismic response. And we want to look at the post seismic response. In short term dynamic cyclic, there is also the case of uh, hydrodynamic cyclic loads, but I'm not going to talk about them today. And uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the first topic and a little bit more on the second topic, but you can find the results of what I'm going to be talking about today uh, in two papers that have been recently published and of which I've included the QR codes for rapidity here. Uh, so uh, starting off with the long term slow cyclic loading in my in the work that I've done so far, I've been mostly focused on trying to capture the accumulation of permanent deformation with cyclic loading and uh, potentially the monitoring response post cyclic. And this is work I've done when I was in Oxford uh, with a group of collaborators uh, and uh, the root of the work is funded on a model that is called harm for hyperplastic accelerated ratcheting model. It's, uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the model, but uh, it's uh, basically uh, modeling the foundation as a big spring, as a macro spring at the, at the foundation level. And the rationale behind doing this is first, it's simple, so it enables a, a, a good, uh, a good first approximation of the modeling, but second, it's really fast. So you can get a very long term cyclic loading response in a very short uh, time. So uh, this uh, model is a multi surface kinematic hardening model. So it's rooted on a kinematic hardening model for those of you who knows what that is. It's uh, framed within the hyperplasticity framework, so that's how we develop the mass. Um, and the, the major aim of this model was to capture the accumulation of permanent deformation with cycle number, which is called ratcheting and is a challenge in itself. And you've got a schematic of the, series, the, the spring series on the left hand side of the diagram here. And uh, on the right hand side, you've got uh, the sort of response that we managed to obtain using this uh, model. Now, one of the really key feature of the model is that it can be accelerated. So in one cycle, you can accurately capture a, a, a load packet of several cycles. And this enables really fast computation of the pi response. 
it can be calibrated and I don't go into the details of the calibration, but the reference to the paper is on the left hand side. And with this type of modeling, what you can do is then uh, capture uh, multi amplitude cyclic loading, which is very important because the signal that the foundation is going to see is involves many cycles of many amplitude. So we tried out this model on a real, uh, a, a more real signal, which is uh, the one on the left hand side. And in here, what you have is the entire duration of the wind turbine lifetime uh, ended with a storm. And you can see that there are over 10 to the power 8 cycles. And using this model, it took me 15 minutes on a fairly old um, standard laptop to compute. So that's pretty good going. Um, and uh, the signal at the end is just one extremely event that I've zoomed out here. And if I model this with harm, what I get is a moment rotation curve uh, at the ground level that looks a little bit like this. And with this, then I can extract what the rotation or the permanent rotation is at the, uh, at the ground level, and this is what I get. And I can separate what is caused by ratcheting, which is in gray uh, on this graph. And I can also look at the final residual rotation, which is very important, uh, and check that it's within the limit of what I can tolerate, which is almost the case here. Right. Uh, so that's for uh, the case of uh, long-term cyclic loading. But when it comes to dynamic loading, this is a different story. And this is becoming increasingly important because when you compare uh, the parts of the globes where we want to develop offshore wind with a map of the earthquakes, you can see that uh, we're going to run into problems. Um, so to tackle this, uh, uh, we've gone into centrifuge modeling because we can't uh, do this uh, with uh, representative stress and strain level at 1G. So, uh, and field test is obviously, we're not gonna wait until there is an earthquake happening. So uh, centrifuge modeling is really the way to go. And this is much more recent research as in currently there is almost no data in the public domain on uh, simulating this sort of uh, behavior for offshore wind turbine monopiles. So this is fairly exciting research. And this is uh, our preliminary uh, published work that I'm gonna present here. Um, so uh, we've done these tests in the 10 meter diameter Turner beam centrifuge at the University of Cambridge. Um, and we've used a servo hydraulic earthquake actuator to simulate the earthquake, which enables us to uh, basically send whichever earthquake we want to, whether we want a clean sinusoidal signal or a more realistic earthquake like the Kobe earthquake, for example. And we use an equivalent shear beam model container to uh, have flexible boundary condition when the, when the earthquake hit and not have reflection of the wave on the side of the box. So this is quite important. And this is a cross section and a few photos of the test that we've been performing for this paper. And what we basically had is a layer of dense sand with a layer of loose sand just above it. And the pile was embedded 50% into the loose sand and 50% into the dense sand. And uh, with, uh, with a range of sensors that enabled us to measure both the ground response and the pile response uh, before, during, and, uh, and after the earthquake. But I'm just going to be talking about during the earthquake in this presentation. And uh, uh, um, if I... Uh, First, we started with an earthquake that was a sign sweep, and we had we had a, an eccentricity with a mass on top of the pile that represented the, the height of the wind turbine and the cell on top. And we started with a sign sweep to find the natural frequency of the turbine. In total, we applied eight earthquakes. I'm going to show the first one, the last one, and one in the middle. The first one is a sign sweep. And with that, we find the natural frequency of their turbine. And you've got that on the right hand plot here. And you can see the first mode and uh, uh, the second mode is the small peak uh, at 1.5 Hertz at prototype scale. Uh, 
Now, the last earthquake that is after a series of a lot of earthquakes that were relatively large uh, is also a sign sweep to check whether the earthquake is changing the natural frequency of the turbine. And what you can see on this graph is that it almost doesn't. So we, from these tests, we can expect that uh, the natural frequency is not altered by the earthquake. But of course, this is a small geometry pile. It's the right length over D ratio, but it's still a small pile. So we will need to do further tests to confirm this, uh, this results, which is quite important and crucial for the industry. And finally, I'm going to show you earthquake number five, which is one of the earthquake in the middle. It's a simple sinusoidal signal that you can see on the top left uh, diagram. It's a relatively large earthquake. It's uh, 15 cycles, but a, a relatively small uh, magnitude and at the natural frequency of the structure. And, and this natural frequency is not point not, uh, it's not point 0.1 hertz, which uh, like you would have, Chi Chi would have hit at not point 0.1 hertz, uh, not point 0.5 hertz, uh, but with a, a relatively smaller peak acceleration. So this is still quite realistic. We, we could have seen that, uh, but may, maybe not for that many number of cycles. And what you can see is that the amplification factor in the response of the structure is of the order of 5.2, which is quite large. And this can be concerning for design purposes. So obviously these are all preliminary results and they need further validation. Uh, but uh, this is research that is current, that we're currently taking uh, forward in Cambridge. Uh, so hopefully we'll have more exciting results to show you in the coming a few years. So in conclusion, um, I've distinguished the case of long-term slow lateral let cyclic loading and the case of short-term dynamic earthquake loading. And in the long-term slow lateral cyclic loading, I've been mostly focusing on how we could capture the accumulation of permanent deformation of the foundation when uh, subjected to wind and wave loading. Uh, and uh, I've departed from the traditional degradation factor, uh, introducing uh, a numerical model that is rooted in the HARM framework, which is a hyperplastic accelerated ratcheting model and uh, can be accelerated to capture the entire lifetime response of the foundation. In the case of the short term dynamic earthquake loading, this is still working progress. Uh, but the preliminary work shows that the natural frequency is unaltered by the earthquake series, uh, but that large amplification factor uh, are to be expected when the shake is at the natural frequency of the structure. Uh, so just to finish, I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators on both project. Uh, on the left hand side, you've got the the group in Oxford uh, who helped me uh, develop the harm model and on the right hand side the group with whom I'm performing the test and the work on the seismic uh, project as well as the industry partner who have enabled uh, the development of this work and uh, further development in the future of the seismic project. Thank you. Thank you, Christelle, for a really interesting presentation there. Um, as I said earlier, we'll save all questions to after the three presentations. Um, so I'll hand the stage over to Chris now for your presentation. Thanks very much, Fiona. I'll just share my slides. Often the trickiest part. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, that's just loading. Perfect, I'll let you know when they come through. Yes, they're through. That's through, great. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, hello, yeah, so I'm Chris Pierce, a principal engineer from Atkins, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the interesting work that we're engaged in for major offshore wind farm operator in the UK 
on a new method for monitoring fatigue loads in offshore wind turbines using tower top accelerometers. Um, so here's a brief overview of what we'll be looking at today. First, we'll cover um, a mini introduction to load monitoring on offshore wind turbines. We'll be looking at some alternative approaches. Uh, then we'll be looking at the physical based model, which is sort of the cornerstone of what the approach we've been taking and refinements to that. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. So just before I start, I want to mention the team that was involved with this project. So along with myself, this work was also undertaken by Ian Ward, Mick Hacker and Alex O'Donnell. So I'd also like to, to thank them very much uh, for their involvement. And, and the four of us are based in Atkins Design and Advanced Technology Practice. Um, OK, so let's begin by talking about load monitoring and offshore wind turbines. So these uh, these structures are fatigue critical, which means that their operational life which is typically designed to be around 25 years, is governed by the fatigue loads it is subjected to. And so by fatigue loads, what I mean is the, the rate at which fatigue damage is accumulated. So if you have an existing offshore wind turbine, it's often necessary to monitor the fatigue loads it experiences. Um, and this can be for several reasons. So it can be, for example, to assess the effect of a change in circumstances that might affect its dynamic behavior uh, and therefore the fatigue loads, such as a change in the turbine's control system, or to estimate the life of the structure after a defect has been found, or for example, to estimate the remaining lives of the turbines on a farm in order to explore the possibility of extending the operational life of the farm. So this last point is increasingly relevant as the first batch of UK offshore wind farms is starting to approach the end of their original design lives. Um, so conventionally, load monitoring is performed using strain gauge systems. Uh, strain gauges are installed at different circumferential positions on the inside of the structure in order, in, also, in order to be able to capture the maximum load as the direction of the wind and waves change. Um, so here's a diagram of an offshore wind turbine. Um, I'll just briefly touch on some of the nomenclature. Um, so the turbine here is supported by a monopile foundation, uh, which we, we just heard about from Christel, uh, which is a single large diameter pile, and it's a commonly used foundation for, for offshore wind turbines, and is also the type of support structure that we're focusing on in this current work. Um, then there's a section of the structure called the transition piece, which connects the foundation to the turbine's tower. And then at the top of the tower, we have what's called the rotor nacelle assembly. Um, the diagram that uh, we, we see on the screen here shows a typical strain gauge monitoring system. So at a particular elevation in the structure, in this case in the transition piece, a number of strain gauges are installed. So the advantage of strain gauge monitoring systems are that they give us a direct measurement of the loading and it's straightforward to translate this, uh, this uh, measurements to, to moment time histories, which can then be converted into fatigue loading using uh, standard procedures such as rainflow counting. Uh, the key thing to remember here is that we're after moment time histories, which strain gauges are able to provide uh, very easily. Also, the measured data can be high resolution, for example, uh, with a sampling rate of up to 50 hertz. However, these systems also have disadvantages as well, so they can suffer from reliability issues, and they often have a limited usable life after which they stop working or give uh, start giving spurious readings. Um, importantly, they also require manual access to install or repair, which means that this requires offshore access, which is very um, can be expensive and is also a risk to personnel involved. Um, because of this, usually only a few turbines within a farm are instrumented with strain gauges. Um, and at the other non-instrumented turbines, the fatigue lives can only be calculated by estimating the loading at those locations rather than using directly measured data. So the aim of this work uh, was to overcome some of these limitations by developing a method of predicting fatigue loads on offshore wind turbines using data captured by existing measurement systems. So therefore, we're, we're not relying on strain gauge systems. So broadly, the method for fatigue load prediction can be categorized into two types. Um, we have, firstly, uh, the use of machine learning models. So these work by processing large data sets of existing environmental and operational conditions, 
So things like uh, wind speed and turbine yaw direction are captured by the SCADA system. So the, the supervisory control and data acquisition system, which um, is a standard monitoring system existing on um, on all of these turbines already. It's a sort of standard um, pre-installed uh, monitoring system. And, and correlating this data with, uh, with existing fatigue loads, so usually captured using conventional strain gauge systems. So from these data sets, then a predictive uh, machine learning model can be trained. Um, and so this is in general, a, it's a probabilistic approach that depends on a large amount of high quality input data to start with. So the second type of approach we can take is uh, what's been called a physical based model. So this is where one makes use of existing data such as SCADA data or data from accelerometers, which are pre-installed in the um, in the turbines in a cell and combine these with an understanding of the physical behavior of the structure in order to pre predict the, the fatigue loads directly. So this is more of a deterministic approach that relies on the creation of a mathematical or computational model of the structure. So in comparing these two general methods, uh, we looked at the advantages and disadvantages of physical based models in comparison to machine learning models for our particular use case. So firstly, advantages are that the physical based model provides insight into the reasons for the predicted behavior and fatigue loads. Um, they can also be adapted to different turbines or farms, while machine learning models are likely to have limited applicability um, such as just being applicable to, say, for example, the particular turbine type or farm um, associated with the data that they were trained with. And lastly, they don't require, a, lastly, physical based models don't require significant historical strain gauge data to be created. So they can be used for farms without existing monitoring systems. So disadvantages of physical based models are that they're dependent on an understanding of the physical behavior. Uh, whereas machine learning models will capture many effects without requiring an understanding of the underlying behavior. And finally, physical based models um, can be reliant on data uh, supplied by third parties. So occasionally a wind farm operator might not necessarily have access to all of the measurement systems within the turbine um, that are collecting data. So that's sort of an extra um, contractual uh, barrier potentially that needs to be considered. So looking at these two methods, we decided to develop a physical based model and particularly given its flexibility uh, for use on other wind farms or turbines and the fact that it doesn't need a significant um, historical uh, data set. So let's look at the input data that we had available for the development of the physical based model type approach. So uh, any physical based model requires knowledge of the structure. In this case, we were developing uh, the physical based model for a particular turbine on a major wind farm in the UK. And we had all of the information that we needed to create a detailed finer element model of that structure. Uh, the turbine on this farm had, uh, all of the turbines on this farm had standard SCADA systems installed, including the, the one we were looking at. And so this was recording useful information such as wind speed, fuel direction, generated power, and so on that we could use. And also we had access to data recorded by the existing accelerometers located at the top of the turbine in the rotor nacelle assembly. Now these accelerometers are orthogonal and so they capture acceleration of the top of the tower in the foreraft and in the side to side directions. Um, and this information is useful um, usually for the turbine's control system actually uh, to detect issues that the turbine might have, such as out of, out of balance of the rotor and things like that. Um, but what we're doing here is actually making use of that data, um, you know, which is really valuable information to inform our model about the behavior of the structure at any particular point in time. So um, in addition, what we wanted to do was validate the predicted loads. So the turbine that was selected had conventional strain gauge monitoring system installed. Uh, from which we had a sizable um, uh, data set of, of seven months in duration. Um, so what we could do then is fatigue loads could be calculated at the locations of the strain gauges using the physical base model um, and then compared against the loads calculated directly from the strain gauge data themselves 
and uh, used as a reference um, by which we could judge the performance of our physical based model um, approach. So if I move on, is that going to let me move forward? Apologies, my slides appear to have stalled. Uh, okay, um, hopefully the yeah. slides will, will catch we're, up with me. We're on slide seven still, so physical based model inputs. Okay, I'm trying to move forward to slide eight, but um, I think my slide pack is, is running behind me, but I'll, is that coming through Fiona, slide eight? Overview? No, not yet. Okay. It's, it's here. We can see slide eight. Oh, maybe I'm. Maybe it's my screen that's then running late. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Carry on, Chris. I'll, uh, sorry. I'll, I'll continue, and hopefully my slides will 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 catch up. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, a key reference that we were using during the development of this procedure is a thesis called "Accelerating Wind Energy" by Koopman. Um, and we're following the same two part process described by Koopman, which is in part one, we're converting tower top acceleration to displacement. Uh, and then in part two, we convert tower top displacement to moment at the position of interest. So in this case, the position of interest, uh, the strain gauges um, that we're using for validation. Uh, so a key assumption in part two is that we're that the response is primarily in the first mode. So we'll discuss this a bit more later, but assuming the response is in the first mode, this allows the tower top displacement to, to be converted to bending moment using an analytical model of the structure. So in this case, the analytical model we were using was, was actually a finite element model of the, of the turbine structure um, developed in, in Abacus. So I'll, I think I'll move on because that slide appears to be misbehaving. Mm, there we go. OK, so let's briefly look at the procedure for part one. So what we what we're doing following this this uh, initial process, according to um, the two step procedure that I just briefly mentioned, is that we firstly resolve the acceleration signals. Uh, the two ortho orthogonal acceleration signals captured at the tower top, and then we apply a, a high pass filter to the signals to remove the low frequency um, component, um, which then allows us to perform a conversion to displacement using double integration. Now, why did we need to apply a high pass filter to remove the low frequency components of acceleration? Um, well, that's because we need to take care uh, to remove any low frequency noise or zero offsets present in the original data before converting from acceleration to displacement. Because after double integration, what, what can happen is that these can introduce significant artifacts in the resulting displacement. So in this study, um, I'm just briefly highlighting on screen a Fourier spectrum of one of the acceleration signals from a sample day of data. And I've highlighted some of the low frequency noise that we're still seeing there in this signal. Now, if you were to apply double integration to that without removing it, um, that can produce significant artifacts. So doing so, actually following the double integration procedure, we then have um, uh, signals of displacement at the tower top. And we move on to part two, where we can convert displacement to moment. We take the displacement at the tower top and convert it to moment at the gauge elevation using the finite element model of our structure. So the moment at the gauge elevation needs to be scaled to the correct gauge orientation. And then this gives us a predicted moment time history at our target location from the accelerometer data. So since we're trying to recreate the loads seen by the strain gauges on this turbine, um, our target locations are the locations of those existing strain gauges. So However, this doesn't capture the low frequency loading provided by the mean thrust that we have acting on the turbine, because actually that low, um, that high pass filter that I described earlier 
all of those those low frequency components that we're filtering out that actually would have included the um the the low frequency um, mean wind thrust acting on the turbine rather than the high frequency gusts and so on so um in order to estimate that uh, thrust on the turbine we um we rely on the the wind speed data captured by the uh, SCADA systems that we have access to and we convert that to um we can convert that separately to a moment at the gauge elevations. So we're not relying on the accelerometers at this stage. And then actually, when we combine those two together, we can recreate um, an overall picture of the moment time histories that we would be uh, predicting at those, those strain gauges. So after going through this procedure, we can generate time histories of load at any target location on the structure and we can compare the resulting moment time histories that were predicted by the phys physical base model at the locations of the existing strain gauges in the turbine with those determined directly from the strain data recorded at those gauges. So we did that for seven months of data that we had available. And here's just an example for a single day. And we can see the um, phys physical base model predictions in blue alongside the, the strain gauges at a few strain gauge locations there. Um, so it's also useful to inspect and compare these moment time histories in the frequency domain. Um, so here we have uh, uh, two Fourier spectra of um, both what I've called the measured moment time histories. So those computed directly from this from the strain gauge data, which we're using as a reference and the predicted uh, moment time histories from the physical base model, both in the same plot. So again, it's blue. Uh, is the the predictions and orange is our is our reference. Um, so a few interesting features stand out here. Firstly, we can see some narrow peaks that I've just highlighted, and these correspond with what's called the one p and three p frequencies, which um, are the frequencies which correspond to a to a full rotation of the rotor blades, uh, or the um, because there are three blades, the frequency at which each blade passes. The tower and that causes some uh, an interaction between the blades in the tower um which is causing these narrow peaks and which are coming through in the loading so that's that's quite interesting but most prominently we see the loading is dominated by a peak at about 0.3 hertz which agrees with the first mode frequency predicted by the finite element model uh, and in comparison only a very small component of loading is associated with the second mode which we can see here at about 1.3 hertz in the strain gauges um, so this provides confidence that the assumption on which the physical base model um, is founded, um, namely that the structure responds primarily in its first mode, is, is a reasonable assumption. Um, and also the, the magnitude of the peak is similar in both the predicted and measured spectra, which is, uh, is important because that's a, that's a key contributor to the fatigue loading we're seeing here. So, Beyond this initial two-step procedure, we looked at refining the physical base model by considering the actual fatigue loading on an offshore wind turbine, um, considering the fact that, that that actual fatigue loading is caused by several different operational and environmental loads. So we have, um, we have wind loading on the rotor and tower. I'll skip over these because I think I've overrun slightly. <laughs> We've caused loading caused by uh, rotor out of balance at the 1p frequency that would occur at. We've got wave, tidal, and current loading acting on the monopile itself um, in the subsea regions, of course. We've got um, inertia force caused by the large mass at the nacelle um, and also a static moment caused by that, that very large mass where the rotor is, is located. Actually, there's, there's usually a, a static uh, a horizontal offset of that causing a static moment which interestingly wouldn't usually cause fatigue loads, but um, because the turbine is yawing with respect to any particular gauge at a fixed position, that would cause a fluctuating load, which can cause fatigue damage. Um, and also we have the fact that the turbine is being uh, rotated by the action of the winds, which can produce torque acting on the top of the tower in the side side direction. So uh, we've looked at refining the physical base model from that um, relatively simple two-step procedure initially to account for any inaccuracies due to the loads which either wouldn't be captured 
by the accelerometers at all, or which, which may actually be misrepresented within the accelerometer signals. So just to briefly list these without going into details, we looked at the influence of gravity on the accelerometers themselves. Obviously, um, as the turbine tilts, um, those accelerometers would pick up a component of gravity within them, which needed to be corrected for. We also looked at correct, correcting the rotor torque that I described, um, the nacelle overhang moment, static moment. Um, we looked at refining the thrust estimator. And then uh, interestingly, and I, I will just mention uh, perhaps a slight bit more about, uh, about this one, we looked at correcting uh, for the action of wave loading on the structure. So obviously the load, the, the main assumption of the load prediction procedure is that it's based on the response in the first mode. Um, now the assumed behavior allows for the displacement of the nacelle to be converted to moment at any target elevation that we're interested in. But obviously from an offshore wind turbine structure, we've got the waves acting at the subsea elevations. Um, so while a component of the wave loading would actually excite the dynamic behavior of the structure and so would be captured by the accelerometers, a component of it wouldn't. So this we're calling the quasi-static wave loading, and we've we've had to do separate calculations here to to account for that, and to effectively remove it from the predicted loads. Um, oh yes, and just highlighting actually how that that quasi-static wave loading is coming through in an overprediction of those low frequencies here, where we see the the blue uh, <clears throat> moment time history spectra actually um, increasing above our reference. Um, that's associated with the, the wave loading. Um, OK, so just to finish then, in terms of the results, uh, we predicted fatigue loads using measured data from strain gauges and moment time histories for this seven month sample. And the loads were, uh, the moment time histories were converted to damage equivalent moments, which is a standard and very useful measure of, of damage equivalent loads. Um, so comparing the results with our, um, and that's just uh, for reference, the damage equivalent moment uh, formula that we used or conversion that we used. So comparing the results against our reference from strain gauges, the predictions were shown to provide a conservative estimate of the fatigue loading with an over prediction of up to 21.5% in the cases that were studied here. Um, so to summarize, an alternative mo mon uh, load monitoring solution to strain gauge systems was developed, which relies on measurements from existing systems, so tower top, tower top accelerometers and SCADA. A few other inputs were required for the current procedure. Um, so actually, what we found during the development of the procedure is that we needed an estimate of the quasi-static wave loading, like I mentioned, which um, we actually calculated from a historical uh, metrological data, and also an estimate, um, the, the estimate of wind thrust on the turbine was calibrated in this case by knowledge of load at the strain gauges. So in the future, we'll be looking at removing the reliance on strain gauges altogether without this calibration. So key benefits of the procedure are that, um, firstly, no manual access is required to install the accelerometers. They, they're already in the turbine, so that reduces personal personnel risk and cost. Um, based on the data we've seen, accelerometers appear to potentially be more robust and reliable than strain gauge systems, um, which might be expected because they're pre-installed systems. And also the developed procedure enables fatigue monitoring of all turbines on a farm without the need for extrapolating loads between assets. Um, so although the current procedure was found to produce conservative estimates of fatigue loading, it may well be suited to a few commonly occurring situations, such as when strain gauge data is not available or to inform the extrapolation of loads across a farm. Um, to perform a comparative study before and after a change in the turbine's control system, for example, um, and may give a more realistic estimate of the true loading compared to design loads, actually, um, which often include a really significant conservatisms. So we're looking to continue to develop this procedure. Um, some areas of focus for future work will be uh, improving the accuracy of the load predictions by exploring more some of these load effects I mentioned, particularly the, the wave loading, and also to further validate the procedure by considering future, um, considering other turbine structures. Um, well, thank you very much for listening.
brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, as I said, we'll have um, questions at the end. Um, so I'll hand this stage to David um, if you want to um, yeah, take the stage. OK. I'll just share my screen. It's all good. Yes, we can see it in PowerPoint format. It's, it's just coming through. Yes, perfect. OK, that's great. Thanks a lot, Fiona. Um, so my name is David Wilkie, and today I'm going to give an overview of um, fatigue assessment for offshore wind turbines using Gaussian process regression. I'm focusing on two case studies that I've uh, developed with um, Carmina Galasso at UCL. So Chris has already talked a bit about the fatigue limit state for offshore wind turbines, um, but for anyone unfamiliar with it, a single load application well below the ultimate strength of a structure is unlikely to cause damage, but repeated load applications can eventually induce failure through the um, nucleation and then propagation of small cracks which can grow for the life of the structure. Wind turbines are particularly um, prone to this type of loading as a result of a number of causes. One is the unbalanced rotor which causes a cyclic load every time it rotates once. Another is when a wind turbine rotor blade passes in front of the tower and momentarily shields it from wind loading. And the third cause is a result of the stochastic environmental conditions in the forms of turbulence for wind and irregular waves. Um, on the screen is a dynamic structural analysis for a turbine. And we would typically run one of these structural analyses for a single combination of environmental conditions. And from that, we would extract a time series of stresses in a component of interest. To evaluate fatigue damage, we would process this stress time series um, by counting the number of different stress cycle ranges within the time series. And to evaluate their damage to the structure, we would use a separate set of laboratory experimentally defined SN curves, which define a relationship between the stress range and the number of cycles to failure for the laboratory experiment. So what we would do for every stress range in the time history is to read off the tolerable number of cycles to failure from the SN curve. And then we can predict the fatigue damage by simply dividing the number of cycles in our time history by the tolerable number of cycles from the SN curve. And summing this across the time series gives us a prediction of fatigue damage. Now, in order to predict the fatigue damage for a wind turbine that's going to be placed in the sea for 20 years, we would do this process for a wide range of environmental conditions and weight the damage predictions at every single environmental condition by the joint probability density function of their occurrence. And the challenge here really lies within the structural analysis. So to build that structural analysis, we have some properties for our wind turbine. That includes geometry and material properties and also foundation properties. Then we've got our environmental conditions and we have to assess them in a way that covers the full range of conditions the wind turbine is likely to experience for its design life. So the, um, the design codes for wind turbines specify a large number of structural simulations, and these have to cover all of the important parameters that are used to generate the wind and the waves, which cause force on the wind turbine. So an example of that is on this slide. We have the mean wind speed, which you typically have a living of. There's a turbulence intensity, which is how does the instantaneous wind speed vary about the mean. The codes allow us to take just a single sample of that. Then there is the misalignment between the wave and the wind field. The significant wave height, which is the average height of the waves. 
the peak spectral period, which is um, gives us an indication of the energy content of the waves, and then seeds, which are the number of repetitions of our structural analysis that we need to have a stable estimate of the fatigue damage. So multiplying these simulation requirements together, we get to a total of about 30,000 structural simulations. Now those simulations are time domain simulations and for even a simple structure like a monopile, they run in about real time. So 10 minutes of simulation requires 10 minutes in real time. So to, to design this wind turbine would require um, 300,000 minutes of uh, simulation time, which is obviously quite unfeasible, especially if we need to rerun this damage calculation. So the code does allow us to have some simplifications. For example, um, the IEC code allows us to use a single value of significant wave height for each main wind speed, reducing the computational burden. But the approach we've been um, developing is to instead replace that expensive structural analysis with a much more computationally efficient statistical model that allows you to sample all the environmental conditions you may wish. And the way we've been doing that is using a technique called Gaussian process regression, which is a non-parametric form of regression that allows us to represent the uh, complex relationships between the different environmental parameters that drive wind turbine loading accurately. And some examples of the um, resulting um, damage surfaces against different environmental conditions are shown on the bottom of this slide. But in order um, to use this method, we firstly need to work out how to um, train our statistical model to um, the structural analysis. And secondly, we need to verify that the surrogate model or the statistical model represents the structural analysis, analysis we want it to replace well. And I'm going to um, show you that through a case study application to the fatigue reliability assessment of a wind turbine. Why is fatigue reliability assessment interesting? Because now the DNV and IEC codes both allow probability based designs. So the wind turbine structure we're using in this case study is the NREL 5 megawatt offshore wind turbine, which is maybe a bit small compared to modern wind turbines. Um, but we're assessing that in 20 meters of water. And we're going to assess it using 10 minute time history structural simulations in the Aero Servo Hydro Dynamic Package FAST. For simplicity, um, in this study, I'm only going to assess a single weld uh, located at the mud line, which I'm assuming is a DNV class D. And then the environmental conditions we use in this study are taken from the three phenol met masts, which are located in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea as shown on the map. And to these, uh, the raw data from these met masts, we fit um, probability distributions as shown on this slide. So the, the ones of interest are the top left, which is the mean wind speed, which is modeled through a viable distribution, which has two parameters. The first is a scale parameter, and the second is a shape parameter. And the other maybe interesting ones are the middle bottom and the middle right, which are the wind and the wave angles respectively. And those are multiple peaks, so they're modelled using a um, kernel density estimator. So this slide shows the marginal distributions, but obviously there's correlation between the different um, environmental conditions. For example, the um, waves are typically generated by wind, and then that's captured through a copula, which allows us to separately model the correlations between these parameters separate from the marginal distributions. And in order to run our reliability calculation, we have to um, extract the factors which affect fatigue damage. So the environmental conditions are explicitly considered within our Gaussian process, so they're covered. In this study, we're not going to model the geometry uncertainty or manufacturing procedure uncertainty, but instead focus on the material property uncertainty, which we know is quite large, particularly for the SN approach. 
So there's two parameters here. One is the tolerable damage. So that's how much damage can the structure absorb before it fails. And the second is the intersection of the SN curve with the X axis. So when I showed you an SN curve previously, um, it only had a single line on it. That's because that's the design SN curve, which is the um, mean calculated from laboratory experiments minus two standard deviations. Um, and that's quite a conservative um, assumption about what the um, S parameters the SN curves has. And to get an idea of that, I've um, plotted along the SN curve at a stress range of 200 megapascals. And comparing the number of cycles to failure at the design curve against the mean SN curve, we have a difference of 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5 cycles. So we're going to explicitly capture this parameter instead um, in our model. But we also have to have a model or some way of telling whether or not we predict the structure to fail or survive um, over its 20 year design life. And we do that by defining a limit state equation. And in this work, we use a quite simple one, which is simply the tolerable damage minus the uncertainty in the SN curve multiplied by the lifetime fatigue damage. And here, the lifetime fatigue damage is going to be predicted using our Gaussian process regression model. And then we can simply do a Monte Carlo simulation to evaluate a prediction for the probability of failure. But we have to train our statistical model um, on some examples of uh, expensive structural analysis in order to make its predictions accurate. And in this study, we use two different approaches for that. The first is to define a grid across all the environmental parameters, such as used in the DNB design code, where you saw earlier, we split up the environmental conditions into a set of points and um, evaluated it at each combination. And the second was a random design of experiments, where I just randomly select points from the joint probability density function of the environmental conditions. And we assessed a number of assumptions about the Gaussian process model for each of those designs of experiments. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into this today, but um, more details are located in the reference paper. And we evaluated the goodness of fit of our model using the mean square error. Doing that, we found that on the left, the Design of experiment using gridded points was quite poor. It had a large mean square error and large bias um, in the fatigue damage predictions. However, on the right hand side, we see the model based on random sampling was much better. It had a very small mean square error and a very small bias, which is the difference between the black mean line and the, um, the red line. However, it still required 6,000 structural simulations, which is very computationally demanding. So we did a study to um, assess reductions in the number of samples and the number of seed repetitions. And we found that 300 samples with two seeds was a good trade-off. To evaluate the overall accuracy of the surrogate model, we had a separate validation set of structural analyses that, that included a full simulation of all the um, environmental conditions the wind turbine was to be exposed to. And we find a ratio between our um, 600 sample surrogate model and the validation set to be within 1%. And that's within 1% both in terms of the damage equivalent load and also the total fatigue life. Then moving on to the reliability simulation, we find that the structure has a probability of failure of about mm. 1 times 10 to the negative 3. So it is a relatively unconservative. But the point about this um, surrogate modeling approach is we can use it for other and potentially more interesting simulations, such as assessing what is the impact of climate change on the structural loading for wind turbines. And this is an interesting application because in literature to date, studies have only really focused on the power generation, not the structural loads. And there's reasons to believe these much, might be much more sensitive than the power generation. 
The problem with climate change predictions um, on the joint probability density function though of the environmental conditions is they are very sensitive not only to the type of model of climate model used to um, make the projection but also on assumptions about carbon dioxide emissions. And so in our study we took a parametric approach where we reviewed literature of different climate change projections um, and we found that a reasonable estimate comparing all the, the models was changing the scale parameter of the mean wind speed distribution by plus and minus 14 percent and changing the shape parameter of the mean wind speed distribution by plus and minus seven percent. Uh, we split those limits into nine and five points respectively and assessed a wind turbine, the NREL5 megawatt wind turbine, for each combination of those. So in this study we had a total of 45 different climate change scenarios. We only changed the mean wind speed distribution, but that will have an impact on, for example, the wave load loading through the correlations defined in our um, joint probability density function using the copula model. And our approach to the simulation is shown on this slide. So we built the structural model for the National Renewable Energy Labs 5 megawatt turbine. We used that to define a Gaussian process, which gave us as output power generation and also structural fatigue damage. We did this um, Gaussian process model for each of the 45 climate change scenarios. Um, so we can see what the difference in fatigue damage and power generation is across those scenarios. Then we um, conducted the structural reliability assessment I showed you from the previous case study for each scenario to find the probability of structural failure. And finally, we compared that probability of structural failure to the probability of other subsystems in the wind turbine, including the generator and gears, and combined that with different system costs to predict expected annual material losses and revenue loss from failure of the wind turbine. Um, unfortunately, because of limitations in the time I've got today, I can't go through the results in detail. So I'm just going to show you the final summary curve we came up with, which compares the scale and the shape parameter of different climate change scenarios across all these um, performance metrics for the wind turbine. And what we find is that um, while the power curve is sensitive to changes in the climate change scenario, um, at the change is between 15 or plus or minus 15 percent. The fatigue damage is much more sensitive, ranging for plus or minus 25 percent. Then we find you can't really see the difference between power and damage though, because the probability of structural failure was found to be extremely sensitive to the different climate change scenarios. The expected annual losses are actually really insensitive to the climate change scenarios because the probability of structural failure is very low compared to the other components in the wind turbine. So even if it increases a lot, um, the probability of it failing is still very low compared to those other components. However, if the structure fails, the revenue loss from the wind turbine is very sensitive because obviously um, the wind turbine can't produce electricity anymore. So I've gone through some interesting applications of um, surrogate modelling to offshore wind turbines, not only in terms of um, reliability evaluation, but in allowing us to do more detailed and um, otherwise impossible studies like assessing different climate change scenarios. So I think I'm going to stop there. So thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. I think, I think um, um, yeah, yeah, just, just want to want quickly, to oh, I can hear myself. myself. Back. That's not, um, let me just see if I can sort that. Perfect. Um, so I'll just take a moment just to thank all of our three presenters, um, Christelle, Chris and David, for really interesting and informative presentations this evening. Um, and I'll open up the floor to any questions for our three um, presenters. Um, so if anyone has a question, feel free to type it in the chat 
um, and I'll um, read it out and to ask our um, speakers. Or if you'd like to raise a hand, um, you can come off mute to ask a question. So I'll just give it a moment for anyone to um, type or raise a hand. Um, I'm just scrolling through the chat as well. Um, so yeah, feel free to raise a hand if you want to come off mute or do type in the chat. One quick, one quick question I have, um, Chris, you just mentioned that you had seven months worth of data. Uh, what, just out of interest, what time of year was that for? And did you have any um, large storm events that you captured data for in that period? That's a really good question, Fiona. Um, I just from memory now, I think it overlapped with um, summer and winter but obviously not for the fall. I can't quite remember whether we were extending more into the winter or not, but obviously you'd expect um, greater loading in, in the winter months. Um, what we actually did for this study was focus on what we were calling normal behavior. So um, we're trying, because this is an initial development of the procedure, the first run through, we had a larger data set in, initially and we went through the SCADA data and made sure that we were just focusing on a normal power generation days when there were when there were um, unusual shutdowns to, uh, or um, other other sort of unusual behavior type events. We'd excluded those from this study just in terms of that initial development. But um, that's a good question, and it's certainly something that we'd be looking at in the future if we do have a, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get our hands on an even larger data set at some point. Um, it would be great to sort of include, um, eventually, the, the final procedure would, would ideally be able to include all scenarios, of course. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got two questions in the chat. The first for um, Christelle. It's asking, can Dr. Abadie comment on the old method by Lin and Lau to calculate the permanent displacement of monopile? Apologies uh -huh. if I've mispronounced um, the, the authors there. Uh, right, uh, that, that's an excellent question. I, I so, so for the other people in the audience, the, the method that is referred to is uh, uh, based on small scale experiments where the maximum deflection of the monopile was uh, recorded for each cycle number at the maximum load uh, during cyclic loading and fitted using empirical law. And, and Lin and Liao uh, chose to fit lookout law and then the other very popular method is that of uh, LeBlanc and Al in 2010, where uh, the fit was uh, using a power law. And, and these were the original ways of modeling cyclic loading to replace the DNVGL option. Uh, and the, the good thing about these methods is that they accounted for cycle numbers. So what was fitted was the accumulated rotation versus uh, accumulated rotation versus the number of cycles um, and you fitted a law and you would plug that in your model. Right, um, so this, this models, what you've got to uh, realize is that first they're based on small scale 1G experiment where the stress and strain don't necessarily scale. So there is a little bit of uh, like uh, danger into applying that full scale. Uh, the second uh, major limitation, I, I won't go into all the details, but the, the second major limitation is that you only get the maximum deflection at the peak load with that sort of method. You don't get the entire stress strain curve. And then when you want to go into modeling multi amplitude cyclic loading, then you need to make severe assumption like miners roll, for example, uh, and consider each load packet and assume that the accumulation of permanent deformation is going to add up, but you're looking at a nonlinear law. So that's not necessarily the case. It can work, but it might not work. Uh, so, so the harm model kind of offers a step forward where 
you get the entire stress strain curve and the modeling of the multi amplitude cyclic loading becomes a bit more rigorous. It actually offers even more than that because the model offers the opportunity to capture the changes in stiffness and damping, which I did not cover today, but is also very important. So hopefully that answers that question. Great, thanks, Pistel. So the next question we have is for David. Um, what are the sensitivities of reliability to the material properties? Hi, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, in the paper we wrote accompanying this, we actually had a larger number of um, uncertainties, including some modeling parameters. So comparing all of those, we found that the um, tolerable fatigue life was the um, largest uncertainty. I think that this, these two um, uncertainties relating to the material properties, it's important to say, relate only to the DNV design code and the experiments that its SN curves are based on. Um, so if you had maybe your own experiments or were using a different code, you may have slight differences in your sensitivities based on how wide those were. Great, thank you, David. So the next question is for um, Christelle. Are there any specific reasons for choosing the layered soil profile in the centrifuge experiments? Is it to match any particular field scenario? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, so yeah, there are uh, several rational reasons behind choosing that specific layered uh, layering system. Uh, obviously, it's the first test, so we had to choose one. Uh, the first reason is that you would first consider a monopie to reach into a competent strata if you've got a, a less competent strata at this at the top. So you're 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 aiming for having something dense with something less dense at the top. And the reason for having a 50-50 is first, it's a it's a laying that we are very used to using in the Scofield Center. So we have lots of experience in first uh, uh, preparing the sample, but also uh, having some data from, say, long slender piles, for example, so that we can compare with them. I'm sure Tejesh is very familiar with that work. Uh, but um, uh, also, it's it's a it's a it's a lane that you might encounter in East Asia, actually. So it's pertinent for the work we're doing. And finally, it's a lane that has been used in other pieces of work on monotonic loading. Uh, for example, the PISA project. So we have some uh, data to compare the monotonic response to. So there's a lot of advantages in using that uh, lane system, uh, and that's why we went for it. Great, thanks, Castell. So I guess this is this next question follows on a little bit from that on the um, topic of um, strata. And so, first of all, well, thanking you all for excellent presentations. Is there any range of insight or understanding over what typical level below seabed, seabed the found in strata becomes competent? Obviously, it's sen sensitive to the nature of the bed, but David appeared to use the actual bed surface, but Christelle may know more from her measurements. Uh, David, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? Uh, well, maybe I go because it's very quick. I think we, we used an apparent fixity model, so there was um, some foundation flexibility in our model, but um, it's definitely, we used quite a simplified foundation model. So I think you're probably better to respond to the rest. <laughs> Uh, so the the laying that you would see on site it really varies with the site. Uh, I, like I like you could have a like you will choose the depths of your foundation according to your site investigation and, and the sort of layering system that you're going to find and encounter at this specific site. So it would be really hard for me to answer that question exhaustively. However, I'm doing a project at the moment where we are looking at the influence of including the soil, not including the soil in the structural analysis. Uh, and I can tell you, it does make a big difference. So you don't want to miss your soil. Uh. Great, thanks, Christelle. Um, 
so does anyone have any more questions? I think we've got a couple of comments thanking you for clear presentations and detailed answers to questions. Um, also comment highlighting how it's great to be considering um, the health and safety and CDM issues um, in Chris's presentation um, related to yeah, the installing of the instrumentation. So that's a good thing. Um, well, a great thing to see that being um, considered and also included in this um, in these presentations. Um, ooh, one more question um, again for Cristal. How many parameters need to be specified for the hypoplasticity model used in the long term condition? Uh, so if you're considering the macro model, as I showed, you need uh, three parameters for your monotonic response and uh, three parameters for your cyclic response. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. So I think last call for any any more questions. Um, at the moment, it's just a flood of people thanking thanking you all. So I I've think one if you if you want to. Uh, oh, yeah. oh yes. Sorry, I hadn't seen a hand up. Um, it's, it's but go fair, ahead. It's, it's, sorry, it's Ian Smith um, earlier to my earlier question about the bed behaviour. Uh, if you go back to more historic stuff, because I'm quite an old person, um, Poulos and Davis and things like that, they, they were looking at far smaller diameter piles than the monopiles, <laughs> but they used to give a, um, a bed line deflection for avoiding fatiguing various different types of material. Um, it was usually a fraction of a percent or sometimes uh, up to a two percent uh, for tension in, in, in embedded piles, but for, for rotational piles, uh, well, rotation and elevation like we're considering here, it was a fraction of a percent. And I just wondered if probably uh, Christelle had come across, that's what my question was aimed at, had come across bedline deflection as a function of diameter. Is that a useful parameter in her experience or is she still working on it? Ah, uh, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I think uh, you would be better off asking this question to uh, a designer. In my opinion, I think you, you actually choose the, it's the other way around. You're going to choose the, the design of your foundation so that you avoid having too much deflection rather than the country. The effect of the pi diameter on the, um, on the pi response, both ultimate capacity and deflection, is something that is still looked at. Uh, so I, I haven't personally looked at it. I tried, but at 1G, it's just, it's not a good idea. So this is something that can be done uh, for at field testing or in the centrifuge. And there are various authors who did it. Um, field testing, I would refer you to the PISA project. Uh, and uh, for uh, centrifuge testing, I think Kligvich had a look at it. Uh, but yeah, I have it myself. OK, thank you very much. And thank all, th all three of you for a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. I think I'll uh, yeah, say exactly the same. Thank you, David, Crystal, and Chris for excellent presentations. It's great to see what um, what work has been done at the moment in both industry and academia on such an interesting um, topic and something that is yeah making so much progress at the moment. So thank you, um, thank you for presenting this evening, and thank you for everyone who's attended for attending and also for um, interesting questions. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody um, for a great evening, and um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening and hope to see you at a second event in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. For inviting us. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.